Please turn again to John chapter 10. We began our meditation on this wonderful chapter last week as we considered the declaration of Jesus, I am the door. We're going to read from verse 1 to 31, 1 to verse 30 this morning as we reflect together upon Jesus' declaration, I am the good shepherd. This is God's word. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hard hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He is a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. May the Lord bless these readings of his word to us. Please keep this passage before you as we reflect upon it further. Well, it's that time of year again. Decorations are going up here, there, and everywhere. And the dark winter evenings are being lit up as houses, shops, public buildings and streets dazzle with multicoloured lights. Many of us will have seen the array of lights in the city centre and around the city hall and the marketplace there. 
They are very impressive, attractive, and eye-catching, especially when darkness descends. Of course, that's when bright lights shine most beautifully and brilliantly, when night falls. In the darkness, the lights shine even more brightly. The contrast of the night sky with the light man magnifies the dazzling splendor and brilliance of the radiant lights. In John chapter 10, there is a comparison and contrast between the brightness of Jesus and the darkness of the religious leaders back then. And the light of the Lord shines all the more brightly against the darkness and blackness of the Pharisees. For the purity of the Good Shepherd radiates even more brilliantly against the backdrop of the corruption of the bad shepherds. In John chapter 10, Jesus confronts these bad shepherds head on and he spells out their appalling sin as leaders. Jesus rebukes and condemns the Pharisees very directly, doesn't he? For the Pharisees treat God's people despicably. They don't care one bit for them. They don't lead them in God's ways. They don't point them to the coming Messiah. Instead, the Pharisees are preoccupied with their own personal concerns and ambitions. They are wrapped up in their own importance. Self-interest rules their hearts. They aren't concerned for anybody apart from themselves. And they place heavy, heavy burdens on the people. They weigh the people down with their man-made traditions, rules and rituals. The Pharisees show no mercy to the weak or the vulnerable. Their callousness comes across horribly. Back in chapter 9, verse 34, do you remember from last week? There are vindictiveness in their spiteful words to the man born blind. You were steeped in sin at birth. The Pharisees believed that this poor guy had been punished for his sin. His blindness was a punishment from God. That's what these guys really thought. What cruelty and arrogance. These leaders had no concern for the man in his pressing need, and they had no joy for him when he was wonderfully restored because their hearts were cold, hard, and far from God. And so they were blind to the acts of God. They couldn't see a miracle from heaven taking place before their very eyes. And they couldn't recognize the Messiah himself, the one standing right in front of them. Their sin was blinding them. And so too was Satan, the father of lies. Indeed, Jesus said very bluntly, in John 8 verse 44 that they actually belong to the devil you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do these were the religious leaders Jesus was, was talking to so Jesus couldn't have been more direct the Pharisees were convinced that God was their father and that they were God's favorites but it was actually the devil who was their father and they were living under God's wrath and condemnation every moment. That was the dreadful reality. And therefore they couldn't see the glory of God in the person standing right in front of them. No wonder Jesus used such stinging language in condemning them. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides and blind fools. Instead of guiding the people in God's ways, they were like the blind leading the blind. And there are still such leaders today, friends. And then in John chapter 10, Jesus here is equally condemning, denouncing the Pharisees as thieves and robbers to start with in verses 1 and 10, and then denouncing them as strangers in verse 5, and as hirelings in verse 12. In Jesus using these derogatory terms we've got to grasp what he was doing jesus was spelling out the stark contrast between these men the bad shepherds and himself jesus was highlighting how these false evil shepherds were nothing like the good shepherd indeed the contrast couldn't have been greater friends jesus described himself as the good shepherd and as he did so, he stressed the adjective good. The original Greek word 
really means excellent. Therefore, Jesus is the excellent shepherd. For Jesus excels both in his character and in his work as the good shepherd. And Jesus excels in his ministry of shepherding. There's no shepherd like him. He is the shepherd of all shepherds. In John chapter 10, there are a few specific ways that Jesus contrasts himself as the good shepherd with the Pharisees as the bad shepherds. These sharp contrasts bring across how Jesus was utterly different from these guys. As we reflect on these glorious truths about the Good Shepherd, my friend, I trust and pray that your mind will be taken up with who the Good Shepherd is. And may your soul be filled with wonder and fresh adoration and worship. And may you dedicate your life afresh to follow the Good Shepherd. There's nobody like him. The first thing for us to marvel at here concerning Jesus is that he is a good shepherd who knows his sheep. I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep. Verses 3 to 5. What a contrast immediately between Jesus and the Pharisees in this. How did Jesus describe the religious leaders in verse 3? He spoke of the Pharisees as strangers. What does it mean to be a stranger? It means that the people don't know you. People don't recognize your voice. And therefore, even though the Pharisees were the leaders back then, God's true people never ever followed their lead because they didn't recognize their voice. And nor did they accept their teachings. God's true people viewed the Pharisees as strangers. They regarded them as leaders they didn't know whose voice they didn't recognize. True disciples would only follow the good shepherd and respond to his voice. Look at verses 3 and 4 again, please. Jesus speaks here of how the sheep listen to his voice and follow him. Jesus calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And as he goes ahead of them, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then jumping forward to verse 27, Jesus emphasizes his sheep listen to his voice. He knows each of us personally. And we follow him. What a contrast with the Pharisees. They didn't know their people. They didn't get close to the public. They stood aloof. The Pharisees made up all sorts of petty rules for folk to follow. And the Pharisees drove people without mercy to obey them. And if folk didn't live up to their standards, they condemned them without mercy. They offered no helping hand. How unlike the Good Shepherd. The difference is is radical. For the Good Shepherd knows his sheep. And he doesn't just know us by name. Our Good Shepherd knows us inside out and he knows us through and through. And our Good Shepherd knows us individually. He knows you individually and personally. And he knows you intimately. Many of us will have heard of a large school in Ballymena called Slemish College. Many years ago, Jenny did some some teaching in Slemish. (coughs) Well, back then, Slemish College had an excellent headmaster called Bobby Jennings, a Christian man. There were over 700 students in Slemish College. But an outstanding mark of Bobby Jennings as principal was that he knew each of the pupils by name. He had a genuine interest in each of them. And he spoke with them personally when he met them in the school corridors or in the playground. It was very, very commendable and noticeable. But Christian friends, our Good Shepherd knows each of us by name and has a keen personal interest in us. But there's far more than that. Our Good Shepherd has a close, intimate relationship with us. And he leads us step by step with tender, loving care along his paths of righteousness. And our Good Shepherd is with us every step of the way. Our Good Shepherd never leaves us for a second. Listen again to his words here. I'm the Good Shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And it isn't just a head knowledge that your Good Shepherd has about you. Your Good Shepherd has a deep personal knowledge of you. 
And so we can have loving, close fellowship with him. My Christian friend, the Good Shepherd, knows you personally. You are not just one in a crowd to him. You're not just a number. Jesus knows you individually, and he knows you like nobody else knows you. Indeed, Jesus, the Good Shepherd, knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your every movement, your every word, your every thought. Your Good Shepherd knows all of your strengths and all of your weaknesses and all of your needs and all of your desires and dreams. Your Good Shepherd knows your joys and he knows your sorrows. Your Good Shepherd knows all of your burdens and fears. He knows all the pressures you face every day. He knows all the, all the daily demands on your time and energy. Your Good Shepherd knows all about the responsibilities you carry. What a blessing to know him as your Good Shepherd. He is the one who knows when you are weary and downcast and feeling like giving up. He's the one who knows all of your physical limitations, afflictions and struggles. He's the one who knows all of your mental and emotional turmoil. And he's the one who knows when you feel afraid or confused or insecure. What inexpressible blessing. All of us who are born of the Spirit have a shepherd who knows us like nobody else knows us. For he knows who we really and truly are. And so we have a shepherd who can meet our every need, for he knows all that there is to know about us. And he's totally clued in to your circumstances. So when we're under pressure, our good shepherd is there to help us. And when we're confused, our shepherd is there to guide us. And when our hearts are sore, our shepherd is there to console us. And when we're downcast, our shepherd is there to lift up our heads once again. And when we're weary, our shepherd is there to sustain and to strengthen us. And when we're troubled, our shepherd is there to give rest to our very souls. And when we walk through that valley of the shadow of death, our good shepherd will be with us there too, every step of the way, to comfort us and to care for us until he takes us home. What supreme blessing. Christian friends, your good shepherd knows you fully. He knows what's on your heart at this very moment. And he not only knows you in his intimate individual way, he also makes himself known to you personally. He reveals himself to you. Indeed, your good shepherd confides in you. Do you ever think about that? Your good shepherd shares with you what is on his heart. He doesn't simply see you as one of his servants. He sees you as one of his friends, as he talks about in John chapter 15. And he lets you in on his father's plans and purposes. Christian friends, we're blessed in the most wonderful way. By nature and practice, we're sinners and deserve to be condemned. But by God's astounding grace, we've been saved from ourselves and our sin and its horrifying consequences. We now know our Creator as our Heavenly Father, and we have a close, personal, loving relationship with God's Son, our Saviour and our Good Shepherd. Nothing in the whole world is more precious than this, and this is the essence of enjoying eternal life. The Good Shepherd knows us as sheep, and we know him. Hallelujah. But along with knowing his sheep, Jesus convey, conveys here, secondly, how he loves his sheep. In verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Friends, no matter how good an earthly shepherd may be, this could never be said of them. Of course, a caring, committed shepherd may risk life and limb to defend his sheep. In the Bible, David defended his father's sheep from wild animals, and he risked his life in doing so. But even such a diligent shepherd as David couldn't lay down his life for his sheep. For if David died in protecting his sheep, what would happen to the sheep? Well, they too would be killed or lost. 
So we could never say these words about an earthly shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. But this can be said most assuredly about the good shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, died at Calvary for his sheep. The good shepherd sacrificed himself willingly. And by laying down his life for us in this way, he's opened up the way for us to be eternally secure. Through his astounding self-sacrifice, lost sheep like us can be found and dead sheep like us can be made alive. My friend, ponder upon how your good shepherd loves his sheep. Dwell upon the incredible cost for Jesus, your shepherd, to be crucified for your sin. Consider the magnitude of the sacrifice that your good shepherd made to save a sinner like you. This is love. This is selfless love in action. The sinless Son of God humbled himself unto death for you and me. And not just to die any death. He gave himself to die the most horror-filled and hellish death imaginable on the cursed tree of Calvary. Isaiah prophesied how the good shepherd would pour out his soul unto death. Your good shepherd poured out his very soul unto death for you and for me. And so Jesus took the punishment for all of our mountain of sin upon himself. And as the good shepherd hung upon the cross, he suffered unimaginable pain and woe. As darkness descended on Mount Calvary, the holy, horrifying wrath of Almighty God came thundering down upon the Good Shepherd. And our Good Shepherd suffered the horrors of hell itself for you and me, his sheep. What immeasurable love! And what a complete contrast again between the good shepherd and the evil shepherds, the Pharisees. Look at how Jesus branded them in verse 12. The Pharisees were like hirelings who had no love for the sheep. The Pharisees were like those hired to do a job. They had no heart for shepherding the people. They were only out to gain a pay packet and prestige for themselves. They didn't have any love for the sheep. They had no bond or attachment to those in their care. And so what would they do when they saw danger coming? Well, they wouldn't put themselves at any risk. When wolves approached, they would flee. Rather than defend the sheep, they would scarper. They would do a runner. And they would leave the sheep to be mauled by wild animals. Christian friends, what a st sharp, sharp contrast between the good shepherd and these bad shepherds. The good shepherd doesn't just protect his sheep in danger. The good shepherd sacrificed his very life to save us from the ultimate horror and danger of hell. He laid down his life that you and I may be eternally secure. Because the good shepherd is no hard hand. He is the strongest possible attachment to us, his sheep. He truly loves us. My friend, do you recognise and rest upon the staggering selfless love of the Good Shepherd? And do you rejoice in this staggering selfless love of your Good Shepherd for you? And are you abiding each day in him and glorying in the wonder of his love for you? You're no longer under his condemnation for your sin. You've been rescued forever from eternal ruin. Therefore, you can now rejoice and forever now and forever, in his amazing love for you as one of his sheep. And so we see here how the good shepherd knows and loves his sheep, but know the third glorious and precious truth. The good shepherd owns his sheep. He actually owns us. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. Christian friends, Jesus calls you and me his own we are those who belong to him. Why? Three reasons. One, he's made us. Two, we've been given to him by his father. And three, he's bought us at the greatest possible price. Yes, he's redeemed us with his own blood. And so he speaks of us as my sheep and my own. This is a thrilling reality. We are those who don't simply believe in Jesus, we are those who belong to Jesus. 
We are the Lord's own special people. We are a people belonging to God. First Peter chapter 2. This is a phenomenal position to be in. It's a phenomenally, phenomenal privilege to have. My friend, perhaps you know the blessing of belonging to a close, loving family circle. Or perhaps you enjoy being a member of a group of close friends. Belonging to a loving family can bring us great delight. Being in a group of good friends can give us great joy. These are certainly wonderful blessings from heaven, but they don't compare for a moment with the blessing of belonging to the family of God. This is the wonderful blessing that Jesus gives us as we know him as our Saviour Shepherd. In Christ, we are members of God's family. We're children of the Lord. We're sons and daughters of the living God, and we're owned by the Lord. We are a people that are his very own. Titus 2 verse 14. We are God's treasured possession. And the wonderful truth is that we don't just belong to God's family in this life. When we pass from this world, we will go directly to our family home in heaven. And there we will dwell forever with God, our Heavenly Father, and with our elder brother, King Jesus, along with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And with God's family, we'll be united in perfect harmony, happiness, and holiness. And together we will glory in our sovereign Saviour and Shepherd, enthroned in all of his splendour. Therefore, as Christ's people, we can say today with humble confidence, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Hallelujah. Romans 14, verse 8. And we can delight ourselves in the Lord as we sing, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My friend, I've got to ask you today, can you truly sing these wonderful words with assurance? Do you belong to the Lord? Do you know the Good Shepherd is the one who guards you and who guides you, who saved you and made you secure? Have you repented of living your own way? Have you handed your life over to, the, to Jesus? And have you submitted to his sovereignty? Have you turned your life over to him? You know, so many profess Jesus as their saviour, but they continue to live their own way, to do their own thing. A profession saves nobody. A profession saves nobody. Jesus must have possession of you. Being possessed by his spirit is absolutely essential. You must be born again. You must be born of the spirit. We must be born from above and changed inwardly by the spirit of God. Repenting of your rebellion against King Jesus and committing your life to serve him is absolutely crucial. May the Lord so help all of us that we may truly know him and love him as our Good Shepherd and Saviour.